I asked to introduce myself to leave more time to talk about Beethoven. My name is Stephen Whiting. I'm a professor of musicology at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance of the University of Michigan, and for my many sins this year, interim chair. <laughs> and at the outset, I'd like to acknowledge my DJ, Sean. I've just made the technological change from LPs to CDs, but I haven't gotten quite so far as to put everything in my computer yet. It's a great pleasure to be here with you tonight. I'd like to give you some words of orientation to the Takash cycle as a whole, and then some kind of orientation for the music of this weekend. Caution is not a word we ordinarily associate with Ludwig van Beethoven. Yet he was cautious about engaging a genre associated by Viennese music lovers with his erstwhile teacher, Josef Haydn. Haydn had been the acknowledged master of the string quartet for decades. His works, above all others, had so raised the aesthetic stock of the genre that by 1800, the string quartet was regarded as the highest, noblest, most intellectual kind of chamber music. To paraphrase Goethe, a kind of idealized conversation between four equally intelligent and witty partners. All through the 1790s, Beethoven studied model quartets by Haydn and Mozart after writing them out in score, because back then, quartets were only published in parts. Not until 1798 did he feel ready to enter the lists with his former master. He accepted a commission from the young Bohemian Prince Lobkowitz for a half dozen string quartets, cheaper by the half dozen. The same commission went out to Haydn. Vienna, you must know, invested in music, the sort of cultural energy we invest in football. Is somebody keeping track of the score? <laughs> Haydn was only able to complete the two quartets, later published as Opus 77, Beethoven's first bundle of six was published as his Opus 18 in the summer of 1801. They served notice on the musical world that Beethoven was more than the latest hot piano virtuoso. He did not return to quartet writing until 1806, after he had revised his opera Leonora a.k.a. Fidelio, unsuccessfully, as it turned out. He set to work on a bundle of three quartets, apparently at the behest of Count Razumovsky, the Russian ambassador to the Habsburg court. I say apparently because the commission itself does no longer survive, nor is there any documentation of Razumovsky's having asked Beethoven to work two or more Russian folk melodies into these quartets. It may have been Beethoven's idea of a compliment. By common consensus, Opus 59 took the quartet out of the realm of private music making by skilled amateurs and into the realm of public concertizing by professionals because the music was just too darn hard for amateurs to play anymore. They are as massively scaled in comparison with Opus 18 as the Eroica seems in comparison with the first two symphonies, or the Waldstein and Pathétique seem in comparison with earlier sonatas for piano solo. Yet, Beethoven always frustrates listeners who grasp artistic development in terms of straight-line evolution. His next string quartet, composed during the French occupation of Vienna in summer 1809 and published as Opus 74, 
betrays far less symphonic ambition than Opus 59. It returns to the proportions of Haydn and some of the strategies. I am not the first to suspect that this quartet is Beethoven's homage and even eulogy to Haydn, who died in May that year. You'll hear it this weekend, and you'll hear its even denser, more compact successor, the F minor Quartetto Serioso, composed in 1810. For once, yes, the nickname derives from the composer. The high opus number, 95, is explained by the delay in its publication till 1816. It is still a middle period work, albeit a thoroughly bewildering one. Then come the five quartets of Beethoven's third or late period. In November 1822, while Beethoven was still revising the Misa Solemnis, he received two commissions from opposite ends of Europe. One from a Russian prince named Galitsin for one, two, or three new quartets at whatever price Beethoven cared to name. The other from the Philharmonic Society in London for a new symphony. Well, Beethoven already had a mental cue of staggering proportions. The Mises Solemnis had to be finished, then three piano sonatas, as it turned out his last, then the Diabelli variations, which had been left sort of on a back burner while he worked on the Mrs. Solemnis, after which he would attend to that symphony for London. It became the ninth. And then maybe some bagatelles for piano, and only then the quartets requested by Golitsyn. A to-do list that would last him nearly the rest of his life. He started the quartets shortly after the premiere of the ninth, and he fulfilled the commission, although Galitzin never quite got around to paying him. In 1858, Galitzin's son uh, transferred the outstanding balance to an account that had been placed at the disposal of the widow of Beethoven's nephew, Karl. That's when the bill was finally paid. But Beethoven had no problem selling the quartets to music publishers. There was suddenly a market for his string quartets. So he kept going with Opus 131 and Opus 135, which was finished in October 1826, almost exactly 190 years ago. Shortly before this, the publisher of the quartet in B-flat, Opus 130, Matthias Artaria, or Artaria, the scholars are at each other's throats about how to pronounce it, uh, he had pronounced the final fugue, finale, or the finale of Opus 130 to be too difficult. He had already asked Beethoven to authorize an arrangement of it for piano, four hands. Beethoven reviewed the arrangement, found it bad, and so redid it himself. Now Arteria asked Beethoven to replace it altogether with a new finale, which he would pay for, and he offered to publish the Grosse Fuge as a separate work. Beethoven, wonder of wonders, agreed, and produced an alternative finale in November 1826. Then he went straight to work on a string quintet. But that alternate finale was the last major work Beethoven completed before his death in March 1827. I believe that the Takach, in line with their usual practice, will play this quartet with its alternative finale in the first concert and then repeat the quartet with its original fugal finale in the last concert. So there's the big picture. Now let me try, in the time remaining, to introduce you to the music of this weekend 
and give you something to listen for in each quartet. I'm going to deal with the quartets in chronological order, bouncing back and forth between the music of two concerts. Uh, if you have only have a ticket for one concert, I'm sorry, but you'll have to listen. This might persuade you to get both concerts. From Opus 18, you will hear the first two quartets in F major and G major, respectively. The F major quartet has been called by Joseph Kerman Beethoven's first exhaustive study in motivic saturation. The motive that saturates everything is the first thing you hear. A brusque turn followed by an equally brusque silence. Okay, that's enough. Anything could come after that. But the ideas that do come next, be they lyrical or gruff, straightforward or abstruse, all proceed from that turn. The first movement figuratively bursts at the seams with expressive contrast, but those seams are held tight by the all-pervasive model. Let's hear that again and let it run for a while. That's uh, the Takach String Quartet, by the way. This is no less true in subsequent movements of the quartet. The principal themes each derive in some way from that initial turn figure. For example, the second movement, Adagio, plays the motive backwards, as it were, by starting with a rising fourth, the motto ended with a falling fourth, dum, da, dum, 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 uh, and building to the turn. The mood is heavy to the point of oppressiveness. This is the movement of which Beethoven's close friend Karl Amenda reported that Beethoven had had the vault scene of Romeo and Juliet in mind. The sketches bear some correspondingly theatrical annotations, for some reason in French. Il prend le tombeau. He seizes the tomb. Désespoir. Despair. Il se tue. He kills himself. You get the idea. But that idea remains vague because who knows which version of the vault scene Beethoven knew. This scene in particular was subject to all sorts of changes and not just in operatic reworkings. The famous actor, 18th century actor David Garrick, had Romeo live just long enough for some pathos-ridden dialogue with Juliet before the poison killed him. Whatever the specifics, Beethoven was in any case writing for one medium, string quartet, in terms of another medium, tragic theater, only to pull the rug out with the scherzo. <laughs> Shakespeare took no more refreshing plunges from the lofty to the lowbrow than Beethoven. In the G major quartet, the motivic tie that binds is the rising fourth. Bom, bom. It's not the first thing we hear, it's the third. After the opening courtly flourish and the starchy continuation, we hear a graceful con conclusion that repeats in ascending fourth three times as if to tug at the sleeve of our aural awareness. Good. 
Very good. So what interval do you think the second movement will begin with? This adagio strikes a note appropriate to an operatic love scene until Beethoven decides to interrupt it with an allegro, during which one can imagine a saucy servant wandered over from some opera buffa, poking her head in from the wings, followed by others who join her in tittering at this tender avowal. And their motive is da 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 dum, da 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 dum. Did you hear the rising fourth in that? Fast forward eight years to Opus 74, the quartet that many of us hear as a tribute to Haydn. Several things point in that direction. First, the key. E flat major was Haydn's favorite key for quartets. Opus 74 is in E flat, a key Beethoven had not used in any of his preceding nine quartets. Second, the quartet begins with a lengthy, slow introduction that sounds subdued and questioning, just like the many slow introductions of Haydn's symphonies. We seem to see through a glass darkly, and that will be answered in just a few seconds by yum, dum, bum, bum, and things will get off. Third, the slow movement adopts one of Haydn's favorite structural patterns, rondo variations. That is a rondo in which the refrain is varied upon each occurrence. This adagio manon troppo is, I think, the most ravishing slow movement that Beethoven had composed to date in any medium. Back probably in 1794, he had copied out Haydn's Opus 20 number no. one, another string quartet in E flat with its slow movement in A flat, and the resemblance between the slow movements is uncanny. Let's just hear the next two tracks back to back. Here's Haydn first. Now Beethoven. The scherzo is the wild child in this quartet, what my children might call a mashup of the Fifth Symphony, listen for the famous rhythm, with the scherzo of the Ninth. The last movement is hardly a culmination in the sense of, say, the Eroica finale. It has an allegretto with variations that actually lightens the expressive gravity in the manner of Haydn's variation finales, which is not the same thing as saying that it is a lightweight movement. As scholars have long noticed, Beethoven's theme alludes to the very theme varied in the first movement of Haydn's quartet, Opus 76, number six, which is in the same key. 
We'll hear Haydn first, then Beethoven. So we have two E-flat allegrettos involving a three-note scalar motive and dotted rhythms. Note the all-important difference. Beethoven treats his upbeats as downbeats and then pulls the metric rug out from under us at the cadence. If you were tempted to hear that as one, two, two, one, two, one, two, start on two this time and see what happens. Let's hear that again. There you wind up on the right beat. Now, as you can tell, I could probably talk for another hour or two about this quartet, which I confess may be my very favorite among the 16. But there's Opus 95. I called it the Wildering. And here's what I meant by that. In common parlance, I'd have a, a three-word uh, acronym for that, but I'll just say, huh? This is the work of such unrelenting anguish and such jolting harmonic non sequiturs that Beethoven himself directed that it was never to be performed in public. We stagger our way to the finale, a heart-rendingly weary dance. We think that dance is creeping to a close, a subdued close, and then we get something quite unexpected. It's as though Beethoven were swallowing Rossini tablets. Uh, talk about opera buffa. We're still trying to figure out. If only we could call him up and ask him. Is this bitter musical sarcasm? Is this a send-up of triumphant, entering and triumphant endings in general? What? Baffling though it is, Opus 95 pales in comparison with Opus 130, where disjunction is the order of the day. Yet this quartet, like the other late quartets, draws upon a common pool of motivic elements. The most pervasive element is a configuration of third and half steps. Beethoven juggles these intervals in various ways. Often the third becomes a sixth, and usually the half steps frame the leap. Consider the beginning of the A minor quartet. That's 
Oscar. We hear a sixth framed by half steps. The scherzo of that quartet gives us half step plus third over and over again. The fugue in the C sharp minor quartet presents yet another variant. These two examples could, of course, be multiplied. One can hardly explain Beethoven's preoccupation with this motive, not to mention the contrapuntal emphasis of the late quartets generally, without reference to J.S. Bach. As you may know, the letters of Bach's name spell out a musical motive in German nomenclature, B flat, A, C, B natural. Da, 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 da. Bach had signed the second Brandenburg Concerto and more obviously his monumental art of fugue with this very motive. In 1825, while he was writing Opus 130, Beethoven also made sketches for an orchestral piece, perhaps an overture, on the BACH motive. He also included the motive in a canon written for the Danish composer Kulau about a week after he started the Grosse Fuga. I don't think it any coincidence that the BACH motive presents the same intervallic configuration that so fascinated Beethoven in his last quartets, a central third framed within half steps. A variant of this motive lies at the heart of the very first phrase in Opus 130. Change several iterations of this motive into an interlocking series, and you have the thorny principal subject of the Grosse Fuge. What was initially disguised now appears in the musical equivalent of neon lights. Still, such motivic connections do not offset the overall impression of something deeply riven. At the risk of heresy, I should like to suggest that Opus 130 is a profoundly and disturbingly humorous work. The humor resides in something so big that it is easily missed, hiding in plain sight. The pattern of movements in the whole quartet resembles a pattern that the Viennese of Beethoven's day would have associated with entertainment music, specifically the divertimento. The Viennese divertimento normally had five movements, the first and last in fast tempo, the inner movements comprising two dances framing a central slow movement. Up to a point, this is the pattern Beethoven follows in Opus 130. After the first movement, with all its wrenching contrasts, follows a little contretemps so bone simple as to imply parody. <laughs> That's a bagatelle in B-flat minor, and there's something almost mechanical about the regularity with which the music ticks away. Then comes an andante in D-flat, 
whose somewhat stilted melodies are undercut by an irrepressibly bubbly accompaniment, for example, in its second theme. The movement seems to look back to a world of periwigs and lace cuffs that Beethoven had left far behind. As in the divertimento, so to here, the andante is followed by a second dance movement marked alla danza tedesca. That's Italian for in the manner of a German dance, or Deutsche, which was the folksy forebear of the waltz. Got all that? Only here, the phrasing and dynamics seem continually to go against the grain, producing an impression of continual tipsiness. Speaking as a professor who used to use cassette recordings, when you had your cassette a couple years too long, it started sounding like that. <laughs> but tipsiness in this case turns to sheer drunkenness in the coda, where Beethoven seems to get all of his motives scrambled up. Of course, one would spoil the joke through academic analysis. And thank you, I'd love to do so. Taking his eight bar theme, Beethoven plays the measures back in the order eight, seven, six, five, one, two, three, four, three, four, three, four, fermata, five, 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 six, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight. After this besotted dance, Anyone hearing the quartet as a divertimento is in for a shock. Instead of the uncomplicated finale one would expect, Beethoven gives us the cavatina, a slow movement of such intensely personal lyricism that it is painful to listen to, as if someone dear to us were dissolving emotionally before our eyes. And then, at the th threshold of the finale, there's a fork in the road. The massive fugal culmination, or the flippant alternative, which is a lot trickier to play than people give it credit for. In the original quartet, the lyrical benediction at the end of the cavatina was blasted away by the große Fuge. With that finale, Opus 130 is a divertimento gone awry a work in which humor and horror alternate with little or no mitigating transition. But with the alternative finale Beethoven composed for it, the quartet ends more like a divertimento.
The substitute finale, like the Grosse Fuge, starts on the note G. That is probably the only feature they have in common. We wind up with two very different quartets, depending which finale is chosen. That's why I applaud the decision of the Tarkovsky Quartet to play Opus 130 twice, at the beginning and the end of the cycle, once with each finale. At the risk of being taken for a Philistine, I admit to preferring the finale Beethoven ultimately gave this work. It's a rondo, sure, but it has a weird structure and enough unpretty passages, not to mention tongue-in-cheek irony, to stand up in the company of the preceding movements with their disruptions and rough humor and, in the case of the Cavatina, heart-wrenching beauty. We assume that original is ipso facto better, but I think it's a dangerous practice to second-guess Beethoven. And here, I think the error lies in measuring the substitute against the original. I think Beethoven proposed two incommensurable solutions to an insoluble problem, that of ending such an improbable hodgepodge of movements, whether in fugal overdrive or with wry humor. In any case, Beethoven liked his next quartet, Opus 131, better. And there he put the fugue first. And maybe that was his last word on the fugue as an answer to the finale problem. Thank you very much for your attention.